Welcome back to The Ground Up Show. My name is Matt Diavella, I'm your host, and today I'm sitting down to chat with musician, singer, and songwriter, Tatiana De Maria. De, I said that like it was a different, it's just De Maria. It's just, I totally screwed up her last name. Uh, anyway, she is incredibly talented, creates beautiful music, she's composed for film as well as television, and her new solo work is absolutely incredible. I encourage everybody to go check it out. On the podcast, we talk about why you need to think critically about your time, the things that you're attached to, as well as your life commitments. Very engaging, interesting conversation that I think you guys are really gonna enjoy. But first, if you've gotten some value out of this podcast, I would love it if you could contribute on Patreon. This podcast is independent and advertisement free thanks to a small percentage of you who are contributing on Patreon. You can contribute to the show for as little as a dollar an episode at patreon.com slash mattdiavella. Or for a little bit more, you can get access to my secret vlogs and AMA where I answer questions exclusively from Patreon subscribers. And I make videos that I do not release anywhere else. So again, check it out at patreon.com slash mattdiavella. Thank you guys so much for watching to the podcast, to the podcast, to the podcast. <laughs> this is weird. I don't know why I did that. Enjoy the show. We'll go into the, the story and, you know, you've got definitely uh, a long career and a lot of really cool things to talk about. Uh, but first, let's talk about what you have been up to lately. Right now, I'm super excited because um, I've just started releasing my first solo material. So I've put three tracks out this year with two music videos, which has been a lot of fun. I'm super excited about it. And uh, I just did the last um, national cross country run of the Warp Tour in the US. And that's a tour that's very close to home because I have a band called Tat. And we, our first tour that we ever did in the US was the Vans Warp Tour. And it was a rock band and we basically <clears throat> did a thousand shows around the world on the same album. So we had sort of done Europe for three years and then came and did the US for three years. And it was a long, long time to tour one record. So it brought a lot of things up being, you know, <clears throat> tired of the same material, but in a way still loving it and still seeing new audiences and seeing how it packs new audiences. And so this summer was amazing. So this year has been great in coming full circle. And the solo material is something I've been working on behind the scenes for a long time. So it's been amazing to be able to take that out there to the TAT fans who've been with me for a long time and to take new music and a new sound out to new fans. So that's what I've been up to this year. I've got more tracks coming. So I have another track coming out on September the 28th called Make Me Feel, which I'm very excited about and which also sounds very different to, <clears throat> to a lot of the stuff in the past. Yeah, it seems like the, the originality is something that can be more challenging the longer that you've been in the game. Mm. So when you first start out, it's kind of like, you know, you, you, have a, you have everything to talk about because you never put out a record, you never made a video or a film. Mm. Uh, and then the further you get, the deeper that you dive into these topics, the more that you want to push yourself to come up with something new because you don't want to keep saying the same stuff over, right? I want to say the same stuff over and over and <laughs> over and over. But well, I mean, the hits will be the hits, right? They're always going to be like those songs that are the classics. And then do they get old though? Like say playing the same shit? Um, well, I mean, it depends. So sort of what you said is, is incredibly on point in terms of, you know, I also wrote my first album when I was 16. So every topic to me was also new in life. I was like, oh, wow, this is something I've just discovered. It's a thought I've just had. And at that point, you're still finding your place in the world. You're still finding your passions and you're still inspired by a lot. And I think that's something that we kind of forget as adults. We so used to being kids and being inspired, inspired so easily that, you know, you get to the age of 25 and you might look around and just think, wow, I feel like I've got nothing to say or nothing to do and, and I don't have any hobbies and, you know, nothing seems very exciting anymore. And I think the older you get, the more inspiration becomes um, a commitment and almost a craft in itself of dedicating yourself to, to being inspired and maintaining that curiosity. So writing the first album, I certainly felt like, okay, these are, there was a song called I Don't Wanna Love You and I felt like I was addressing a topic when you don't wanna love someone. There we go, put that in a box. Stay mm. up all night, you know, it was, it was a situation where I was going through something pretty heavy and, and I had someone by my side and they, they seemed like, um, 
sort of just concepts that held water as far as the human existence goes. And as you get older and you experience different things, you do end up going more into depth. So you might feel like I've covered that topic of I don't want to love you because now I'm in another situation where that hurts, but it's a different angle. And you realize that the broader strokes that you might experience as a teen start to get so many different colors and brush strokes as you get a little bit older and you experience different things. And, you know, as a teen, I was always hanging out with people who were older and I was touring and, you know, I I was supposed to go study um, initially uh, nuclear and particle physics in university. And then it became chemistry and law to free up the time so I could tour. And then Eventually I didn't go, so I was just touring. And so here I am doing all these things and seeing all these things and feeling like like a lot of us feel, I think, at that age of having something to prove and also being like, I fit in this adult world too. Fuck you. Excuse me. Um, do you, you swear on your podcast? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, it's another mom. thing I should have told um, you. <laughs> yeah. So so you get, I mean, depending on who you are, I was, I was the youngest of four and I think I felt the need to be able to kind of... <clears throat> express myself in the beginning you have to you just get inspired especially when you're young you're just inspired Mm. to create and put something out there because everything is new but then when the older we get the more we have to really um plan for inspiration and we have to actually sit down and do the work and i think i think confidence comes into play there too because when you're in a platform of being with your peers and being at school you have confidence in yourself for perhaps different reasons you know like you I'm trying to think back to, I don't know, let's say you're at school and someone you like likes you back and you are wearing cool shit that day and you just feel fire. And gradually, gradually, you know, like we talk about people who have different different setups in high school than they do in real life. So there's obviously the saying you've peaked in high school and then, you know, you get into, you get into life. And so we all evolve and find ourselves at different paces. So you might feel very confident at a younger age too, because everything is so new and not only is it new to you, you don't realize it's only new to you. If you look back over the last hundred years, you see that a lot of the concepts that you've felt, thought and expressed have been felt, thought and expressed before in a lot of different ways. And you start to realize that the more you read, the more you grow, the more you experience. And then we were like, oh, so here I was thinking, yes, I'm saying this for the first time. And really, like, it's been said many times before. So I think that plays into confidence as well in a large part. So sharing my experience of writing something at the age of 16 that I was very connected to and came very easily to me and that I would come home and just write every day. And a lot of the album was just freestyle. They would just say stuff and it would come out, it would make the record. And that was it. And that was my debut album, Soho Lights, which we ended up touring. Um... But as you tour more and as you start to set expectations on yourself and as you go through different processes you and life, paying bills, touring, responsibilities, whatever it is, um, you start to forget in a way that that inspiration is still waiting for you. It's still waiting to be discovered and things don't come as easily. So that does play back into, you know, commitment, commitment to being inspired. Mm. Yeah, and when you think about originality and, and as you said, the older we get, the more we realize we actually don't know anything and the more we get a the context and perspective that there is so much that we don't know. There are so many topics that we have yet to explore. So maybe if you're feeling stuck, if you feel like you keep uh, talking about the same thing or writing songs about the same thing, maybe it's that you haven't experienced enough or you haven't explored enough. Well, I think um, I think at every every age and every part of the creative process, I think we're all bound to feel like we've reached the end of a particular road and we all get into this thing of going, okay, I feel like I'm saying the same thing or I'm just playing the same chords or there's always a rut that we get Mm. into. And the greatest artists out there to me are the ones that are able to maintain their curiosity. They're able to embrace change. They're able to look at something and go, oh, cool. Like, how can I keep this fresh for myself? And sometimes it comes in ways you don't expect. You know, you watch a movie and you forgot that a certain part of you existed. You forgot that you could feel a certain way. Um, be it, I mean, a sad movie or even a superhero movie. You know, you watch it and you suddenly feel like, oh yeah, hell yeah. Like if this person can turn the world upside down, so can I. Random things where you never, you you never really knew that you were neglecting that part of yourself. And I think that's something that happens. We sort of get into these um, homogenous existence of 
okay, so this is what I've been taught my whole life, um, you know, pay bills and do this and do that. And whether we like it or not, there is still a subconscious programming of by the age of 30, this is what I want to have achieved. And I think anyone listening to this podcast, I don't think anyone is immune to have had that thought at some point or still has that thought niggling in the back of their mind, whether we like to admit it or not. And your subconscious dictates your behavior. So if you're sitting here with a subconscious plan, you don't always allow your conscious mind and your conscious self to pursue what you want to pursue and what you feel you really need to pursue. So for example, you might go, yeah, I want to make crazy stuff. And yeah, I want to get really inspired and do things. But your subconscious mind, your reptilian brain is there to protect you. So let's say, and this is sort of to, to go a bit more into detail into why we resist change sometimes and why we don't allow ourselves to follow inspiration. So on one hand, you've got the idea of all I need to do is be inspired. Where do I find inspiration? Okay, well, sometimes it takes work. You have to sit down and make a list. If you sit down and make a list of 20 hobbies you've liked in life or you've done, you might find it really hard. It might take you a long time, depending what age bracket you're in, how curious you are and how much, how fully you live at this moment in time. Um, I found it really hard. So, so if you list your hobbies, you might look at it and go, well, damn, I don't, I don't actually have many hobbies that I enjoy. So firstly, start by making a list of 20 hobbies. And this is a little challenge for yourself. And then once you've gotten that list of 20 hobbies, look at them and then next to it, write when the last time was that you did those hobbies. Because <clears throat> I think there are, there are a few different things that affect sort of how we operate um, with our passions with creative endeavors and with life in general, there's time, there's attachment and there's commitment. So time, a lot of the time, we don't see it disappearing. You might look at that and I did this and I realized I was like, yeah, I go to comedy clubs all the time. The last comedy club I'd been to is eight years ago. So mm. we sort of think we build these stories in our head um, and interpretations, we're interpreting machines and we've built in our head, okay, this is who I am, this is what I do. But if you really look at who you are and what you do in practice, you might find that it's very different to how you think you are and what you think you do because time flies. So a few things to sort of managing your inspiration, I think, and creating is let's take the time factor, for example. <clears throat> you might seem to or feel like you're spending a lot of time doing a certain thing. I'm a musician. So, you know, I write records, I produce them and I release them. A lot of people might look at me and go, okay, so you spend your time recording and producing and releasing. But actually a lot of my time is spent doing the business. A lot of my time is spent doing deals on the back end. A lot of my time is doing stuff that's on the back end um, that doesn't relate to the music and it can get frustrating for me. So it's building a team as well around what you're doing. Um, so this year I've been building my team so I can sort of delegate more and focus on what my purpose is. And for me, that's wanting to help. Music is something, is something I'm able to channel um, and do. And that's a way, that's one of the vehicles I like to kind of use from, to express myself and to get my messages and shit out there. I mean, I want to say my messages in that way, but to, to express and get my ideas and thoughts out there. With that said, time, is something that is incredibly precious and yet we don't always recognize how we spend it. So if you write down what you did every day for a week or what you did every day for a month, you might find that in your head you're thinking, well, I'm doing all this stuff and you know, how come I'm not where I wanna be or whatever. The truth is, are you really hyper-focused on what matters? So let's take the colloquial example of a mainstream musician. Let's take Drake. If you're Drake, you make music, you are Drake, you write lyrics, you sing melodies, you do a lot of stuff on the back end, but your primary hyper-focused use of your time is towards writing, for example. I would hope and assume, because Jake Drake is an incredibly prolific artist. Yeah, yeah. he just got called out for <laughs> ghostwriting, though, didn't he? I don't know if you heard he that. You know what, let's just scrap <laughs> that I said all of that. No, um, no, I'm sure, I'm sure he writes. Well, look, I think, I think if you're releasing that many albums, um, to a degree, you're working hard and you're being prolific. It's like it's like getting at entertainers, for example, and saying they don't work hard. 
they might not write the music, but they work hard. Mm. And the press that goes along with being an entertainer is also very demanding on your time. So there's respect for different things in different fields. Sure. But we let's take Drake back to his first album if you want to do there that. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Because so nobody's ghostwriting for you for your first <laughs> album unless you have a ton of money. I mean, well, exactly. Yeah. Or you just, you know, have such a pretty face and you're just like, yo, true, man, true. I'm Drake and I'm that hot. And, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So essentially, let's say that Drake is sitting there going, okay, as a musician on my first album, um, being a musician, if my album blows up and blah, blah, blah. If you take the commercial aspect of it, because it's something I think people can relate to and understand in a, in a tangible way. Let's say that the musician stands to make $10 million in a year as an arbitrary example of a successful pop musician. Mm. Okay, the manager of that musician might make 15 to 20%. So you scale that down. Okay, the manager's making 1.5 to $2 million. All right, cool. So then you've got maybe someone who's on salary under that, who's a day-to-day manager, um, who's managing operations, office operations, and they might be making, you know, $150,000 a year. And then you might have, let's say, a social media person or a marketing person or PR or whatever it is that people hire, and they might be making five grand a month at that level. And so they're making 60 grand. And I say that to say, if you look at how your time is spent, what is it that you want to do and who is it that you want to be? So if you want to be a musician, you want to be creating the music. You want to be channeling your inspiration. You want to be feeling that every single day. And sometimes it's like, well, I just like making music. I don't know what music I want to make. And I've had friends who've said, I I want to be creative. I just don't know what my medium is. And then we really have to scale back and do some work on ourselves and go, okay, what is it that brings you joy? Essentially, it is that simple. When you're in school and they say the universal truth of do what you're good at, but do what you enjoy, It's there for a reason. It's not just do what you're good at. I mean, there are things I've found that I'm good at that I don't enjoy. Um, So do what you enjoy. Because I think when you're doing what you enjoy and you're enjoying it in the moment, good shit happens. And I found that whenever I've just done something, not only have I done more of it. So if I enjoyed writing songs, I just wrote and wrote and wrote. The more you write, the more you have to put out, the more you have to put out, the more people can hear it. The more people can hear it, the more it perpetuates that sense of, mattering and doing something and having a purpose and pursuing it so with that said when you look at where you spend your time if your purpose is to again the example of being a musician be a musician look at the hours spent in the day are you doing the 10 million dollar a year job are you doing the 1.5 million dollar a year job are you doing the hundred thousand dollar job or are you doing the sixty thousand dollar job and by that i mean are you doing all the business in the back end that isn't writing music? Are you spending all your time networking and doing PR and all that sort of stuff which isn't writing music? Are you managing your project? And there's a belief that when you're creative, you have to be a better CEO than you are creative, which in some respects is true, CEO, entrepreneur. Why? Because you have to manage your business in a way that gets your stuff out there and is organized and is well put into place and delegates correctly and just in terms of building a business. So you can now in life, which is amazing, create something, throw it on YouTube, create something, put it out on Spotify. And that's amazing. And and it works really well. People have built fantastic careers on doing that because what they're doing is generating content and hyper-focusing their time on creating what they want to create. So I'm saying all of this to say, when it comes down to time, we think a lot of the time that we're pursuing something, but we don't always realize that our actions are not following through with what we're trying to do. And we're not being the type of person that would achieve those goals or do those actions. So we'll say, I'm just gonna do, do, do this, 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 and this. Okay, but who are you being? Are you being the musician? Are you being the manager? Are you, and at the end of the year, you're gonna look at your goals and you're gonna say, okay, who was I all year and what outcome did I generate based on that? Mm. And that's A, from a financial perspective, but B, did you write those 10 songs in the year? Did you finish doing that work? Did you really put your heart and soul into it? Or did you spend the year calling yourself one thing but doing another and wondering at the end of the year why you didn't get to where you wanted to get? Maybe it comes down to the 80-20 principle of 
especially when you're first starting out and you have all these things that nobody's going to do for you. You don't have the money to do it. You don't have the, you know, you're, you maybe aren't at the point where you can get a manager or a talent represent, representation. There's a lot of competition out there. So for you to initially break through sometimes takes the initial creation. It takes the networking and doing the branding, doing everything that is required to say, put out an album. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually as you progress, if you aren't able to then give away some of those responsibilities, you're likely going to be hurting your future growth because like you said, you should be thinking about what is that focus that you want to put everything into. And maybe it still is, it's down to that. It comes down to 80, 20, cause there's always gonna be other stuff that you want to do. You want to mm -hmm. be able to give the creative decisions and you want to talk about the album artwork and to be able to just step back and let everybody do everything that is a part of your brand is, I don't think, the best idea, uh, but are you spending 80, 90% of your time focusing on what people come for? You know, what is it, what is it that you want to create and why is it that people follow your work? hundred percent. So there's also different ways to go about it. Cause we have this belief that again, you have to do certain things and follow a traditional model to make something work. There are SoundCloud rappers out there that are just in their homes making making mumble rap, uploading it to SoundCloud and it's exploding in a lot of ways for them and creating a lot of careers. Um, and they're not touring the world. They're not piecing everything together. And I'm not saying that's it's a bad thing at all. I'm saying that there are so many different ways to do it that we think we need to sometimes exhaust ourselves to do this and build that. And I don't really like to operate by that model where I have to create this amazing website and do this and do that and everything has to be in place and I have to act as if I was a major label, but I'm independent. I'm, it's just... For me, it's about I'm going to build my business the way I need to build my business that works for me. Um, and sometimes I dedicate too much time to things that are a bit ancillary in a way because it really comes back to creating the content, whatever field you're in. And I think SoundCloud artists are a really good example of the fact that you can just focus on the content mm. and keep putting the content out there. And part of being a good entrepreneur is making sure that that content is consistent. So I think we value a lot of other things and I think that comes into attachment. So we have time, which is be hyper-focused on what makes you matter and what you want to deliver. And then attachment, which is being attached to the idea that maybe I'm not good enough or being attached to the idea that I have to be this or being attached to the idea that you need to represent something that you always thought you needed to represent. And again, you look back at your day to day, are you really that person? Do you really need to represent that? Is that really something that matters? And, you know, a lot of the time our, our subconscious, our past stories get in the way of what we're trying to do. So the need to prove yourself or be something stops you from freely creating in a lot of ways. And then you come all the way around to commitment where, to quote Jim Fortin, which I really like, is, um, is to say there's, well, an example of someone going to the gym and saying, okay, I want to get slim and I want to be fit. And... They start going to the gym and again, New Year's resolution, January. By the end of January, 90% of people have decided, fuck it. And you know, it didn't work and I didn't do it. And then we go the rest of the year. But there's a few people that are walking around who've stuck with it. And essentially what happens is we want motivation to dictate a lot of things. We want to feel good about a lot of things. We want to feel like, yeah, this feels good. A lot of the time going to the gym doesn't feel good. But give it two weeks. If you commit to something every day for two weeks, at the end of two weeks, if you start to see a result or you start to feel good, you start to feel strong, that generates motivation. The motivation feeds more commitment and more commitment feeds more motivation and then you start to build. So I think there's a few factors. There's, as we grow, we forget that we need to look for inspiration and that becomes, again, a commitment to being inspired, remaining curious, and it becomes work to not be jaded and not get stifled committing your time to what your purpose is and really following through with that. Committing to failure by letting go of attachment and saying, okay, if uh, I don't need to represent this, I don't need to represent that or I'm gonna try and people are gonna judge me anyway. So fuck it, people will judge you no matter what you do. You could give all your money to charity and people will still find a way to shit on you. You gave it to the wrong charity. You know what I mean? Or someone, then you find out that like, some secretary in that charity, you know, like did something wrong. Fuck the charity. That's it. You're mm -hmm. out. And then there's a lot of, there's you a lot. You give enough, right? Uh, well, like, did you, you did know? you give enough? And yeah. yeah, there's, there's so many different angles people take. People will judge you. Do whatever the fuck you want. Um, 
And then lastly, you know, commitment is to me at the foundation of everything. Finding out what makes you tick, what gives you joy, more importantly. Um, if I don't enjoy writing songs, there was a period where I didn't and I was forcing it. And I didn't, I'd look at the songs and I just, it was a self-perpetuating thing of going, I don't like the song, I don't like myself. What the fuck am I doing? Questioning, questioning. Committing to inspiration, committing to, hang on a sec, why is it important? Why did I get started in the first place? And the reason I did was when I was a kid, I was 14, um, I had a lot of anxiety and a lot of shit going on. And the only thing that made me feel better was listening to music. And I remember going, wow, I've discovered the fucking cure. This is amazing. Obviously, again, I'm 14. It goes back to the fact that everything's brand new. And I was yeah. like, music is the most amazing <laughs> thing ever. Um, and I have to tell everybody that this is the cure. And in a very, very pure and simple way, I started making music. And the feeling I had with every song was I had to feel, when I was writing a song, playing on my guitar, it had to feel the way I felt when I was completely resonating with what I listened to. And that's how I wrote my first album. And that's why I felt it came so easily because the idea was so simple to me. It was, does it feel right? Yes, it feels right, go for it. Now as adults, a lot of the time we've disconnected from our feelings so much, we're afraid to feel. We sort of, we spend our time on social media, we're like, okay, I'm just gonna watch a movie. Being alone is really hard, being alone with our thoughts. And we start thinking. We don't always operate from a gut instinct. I think we marvel at our friends sometimes who are just like, well, it just didn't feel right. You're like, hang on, but didn't you think it through? What about this job that you didn't take? You didn't think of all the parameters? No, it just didn't feel right. That's it. Mm. That's a beginning, middle and end. Things that don't feel right generally in time still don't feel right, but you're still giving your time to them. So anyway, I felt like it was just the cure to everything followed through with it. And in time, you start to get caught up in touring. You get a bit tired. You start to think about what you're writing and you want to say more, but you haven't been living because you've been touring so much and sort of a different experience of living. Um, and yeah, in time, you you find that you might disconnect a little bit from from your gut. And it might take a bit of commitment to, again, inspiration and to yourself to come full circle and find that passion again. Starting so young, starting at... 14, 15 years old, mm. having two top 50 in the UK charts, uh, or top, yeah, right. You had two songs in the top 50 yeah, yeah. in UK by 18 years old, having that kind of success that early on, did that have a negative effect in the long run? Or was that just, uh, did that, was it all positive? Did it allow you to then um, pursue music and realize that this was something that you could continue to do full time? Because I imagine, you know, a lot of times, when you, you find success very early on at a very young age, it can kind of fuck with you a little bit. Yeah, I think there were, there were several factors, except what I will say is that I was still independent and we had had conversations, for example, with major labels at the time. And the conversation was, we really wanna get you, you know, we really wanna sign you, um, will you write with this big pop artist and you know, write your album in sort of this vein. And, and at the time, you know, I was, a, I was a teenager and I was like, nah, punk rock, fuck you. <laughs> but I was also like, well, I've listened to this dude's album and they all sound the same to me. And it's, I'm in it because I want to write because I'm passionate about the writing. So it was an interesting process of, now that I look back, I think, I look at the opportunities. And again, it was all feeling based. And that's what I loved about that time was it was so pure. And I was like, no, I don't want to write music like that. Or it was, your bandmates are older than you. Um, and it looks manufactured, um, but it's not. So can we manufacture a band around you so that you can then not look manufactured? And I was like, what? It's kind of, I understand where you're coming from, from business perspective, but it didn't feel right to me. So there were a few things where just sort of navigating that process. So we remained independent and we did a deal with the Extreme Sports Channel, which was awesome. And they made this hour long documentary and they blasted it around the world. And it was an interesting situation where it didn't, I was working so hard and I was writing a lot and I was doing so much of the work that it wasn't, firstly, we weren't, it, we didn't explode and become the biggest thing. I don't think it was a, an unhealthy amount of success. I think it was a good, for me, sort of light to sort of determine, okay, people are vibing your shit. This is good. Um, keep doing what you're doing and get a bit of a taste of how it's, how, how it's being received. Um, with that said, I think if I'd had more success and had I maybe left it in the hands of other people 
And had I gone, yeah, okay, I'm after the success and I'm after the exposure and let this guy rewrite my songs or do whatever he wants to do with them, I think I would have, my simple answer is I feel like I would have hated myself. I feel like I wouldn't have been true to myself. And again, the whole point of why, what do I want to do? What does make me matter? And to me, it's just sharing my ideas. It's just saying what I want to say. It's going through shit and knowing that as humans, we all feel the same range of emotions. So somehow as a teenager, I was just very clear on this notion that if I feel something, people out there are bound to feel it. And I was very, I was very simple with the approach of people like so much different shit on planet earth that if three people like my stuff, I'm okay with it. And I was very, very genuinely okay with it. And I thought someone out there is bound to get it because there's so much, there's such a variety of music. So I put it out there and that was my expectation. So when things exceeded my expectation, it was great and it was really cool to continue and to pursue and build. But it wasn't so much that it hampered anything. And actually I'm grateful. Mm. I'm really, really grateful that it didn't get any bigger than it did at that time. Because I think it was perfect for me to take it and keep growing. But it wasn't enough that I lost so much of a sense of myself and started relying on others um, within the industry. So is, it, is there also now a cap to where you would want success to go for you? Say like now venturing out and doing this solo project. Mm. Like it, it's kind of like ironic to think about. You cannot control that, right? If it just explodes beyond, yeah. uh, you know, if it just gets so popular that you have no control over where it spreads and where it goes. A lot of times in creative fields, we don't, we can't control our own success. Yeah. Um, is there a point where you'd be like, oh, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be like walk into a grocery store where people recognize me or where I can't go out in public. Uh, or is there, is that something that you would be okay with? I wonder if anyone's really okay with that. Yeah. I think one of my biggest core drivers is freedom. And I think having my freedom to move the way I want and do what I want um, is extremely important to me. It's, mm. I would probably say one of my two top core drivers is is freedom and so yeah it in you know obviously there have been um moments and times where I'm, I'm shopping and i'm buying a snuggie or something and you know someone will be there and like oh hi and we'll be standing in line and i'm just at that point you know i would check my shit and i'm like what am i buying <laughs> is this, yeah this is embarrassing like i'm just gonna hide this massive dildo you know what i mean yeah. so so yeah, there are, there are aspects of it that I think about. And I think also subconsciously, we hold ourselves back. Again, your subconscious drives your behavior. So you might wonder, people have looked at me before and asked me different questions in terms of, you know, a new record will come out or something will be happening and I'll be buzzed and they'll say, okay, like, are you, um, are you excited? You know, what does success mean to you, et cetera, et cetera. And there, a lot of the times you might not realize that you're afraid of success. You might not realize that you embrace success. You might not realize that I'm an extremely private person, extremely private person. And I like maintaining my privacy, but in my songs, I have to be very honest and put everything on the table. So it's sort of this, this double-edged sword for me where I'm going, okay, well, on one hand, I'm extremely private in real life. On the other hand, I put it all on the record. And I've also, this is what I'm ex so excited about with the new album is I feel like as I'm writing and as I'm building it, I'm being more honest than I ever have been. And if you looked at my past records and what I was writing when I was 15, 16, yeah, I'm being honest. I'm saying whatever the hell I think. But there was a part in the middle where I wasn't being as honest as I wanted to be and I chose not to release some of those songs. Um, but I think to answer your overall question, yeah, it. The idea, if someone said to me, would you like an existence where you can't walk it, you can't go anywhere without being, you know, hounded and harassed? And there are plenty of people on planet Earth, well, plenty. There's a handful of people who experience that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't look like fun. Um, and I think your music can be very successful. And, and I think if it is, and you're lucky enough to have that, and, it, and that's what you want, and it gets to as many people as possible, which is certainly what I'd like it to do. I think I'd I'd very much want to find a way to manage it so that the music is doing the talking and I'm able to live my life. And, you know, going out, mm. I've gone out with some very famous friends and some of them will put their name on a restaurant reservation and some of them won't. And I'm like, I understand that you wanted the table, but at the same time in doing that, you've now just got yourself a swarm of paparazzi. And sometimes it's deliberate, sometimes it's not. And then Daniel Radcliffe, 
I loved what he did. He did something very smart where he just wore the same shit every day. Yeah. And I love that because I was like, that's great. They're not getting, they're not getting a great picture. But sometimes, you know, there's, there's ways to kind of work with media to a certain degree. And again, I just, I, I don't know that anybody wants to be hounded. I don't know that anybody wants that life. Maybe they do. I'm not one of those people. I think for me, it's really about the work. It's really about the music. And I would love to be able to get my music as far and wide as possible to be able to tour, to be able to connect with my fans and at the same time retain some privacy, retain my life. And, and you know, that's an ideal situation. I mean, I'd be mm. lucky if my music got that far and wide. I'd love it. Um, and then, you know, I think about other, I mean, Alicia Keys, for example, who who you never see splattered all over the, all over the tabloids. Um, but then other artists, you know, do. You never really know why. I don't know their lives. I don't know their circumstance. But I'd like to think that there are ways to, to a degree, be able to manage that. Yeah, there is. I guess you're right that there is always an element of control with at least like how you might be, how media might play an effect on your life. Because mm -hmm. if you are the attention seeking uh, musician, performer, Instagrammer, whatever, I mean, there certainly is that group of people who are just trying to get attention by any means necessary. Yeah. Uh, and they'll do it by doing shocking things or not really ch sticking to their ethics and morals. And I think if you can, you even if you are recognizable on the street every day, uh, it's probably going to be a lot better off than having, you know, for a swarm of paparazzi following you around because you're going to do something crazy. Well, at that point, then, you know, if you're being followed and watched all the time, it's, I, I imagine, and again, I haven't been in that situation. So it's just conjecture, but I would say that we already analyze what we do enough. You know, social media, I like connecting with fans and I like posting when I get to connect with fans and I like having conversations, but I don't like stopping what I'm doing to take a picture and say, hey guys, look what I'm doing is, and I remember it's funny because mm. My friend Amber Ray, who, who introduced us, I remember when Foursquare came out and she was like, Foursquare, it's this thing. And I think she was working with Foursquare at the time or doing something. And she was like, you know, you can tell everyone where you are at all times. <laughs> and I was like, that sounds like a fucking nightmare. Like I'm taking a shit. Yeah. No one needs to know that, you know, or I'm, it, I think we, we get disconnected from the moment and, and we know this, you know, yeah. we're at the point where we're self-aware enough with social media to know, okay, there it's good sides where we can retain the control of putting our creativity out there. And you can make something, dump it on the internet and see what happens. And that's fantastic. At the same time, yeah, we're still finding a balance. At what point in your day are you not holding your phone? We're in LA right now, the map to go everywhere. You know, your phone is ringing, your email, you're off somewhere. There's in LA in particular, your phone barely leaves your hand if you're having a functioning working day. It's an extension. And you think about that and you think, okay, in 10 years time, we're not going to want to, this is the equivalent to a brick phone back in the day. You know, it's something that has become such a necessity. We're not going to want to hold it. And I mm. mean, look, I would like, I would rather hold it in my mindset now um, than think that someone's going to, you know, have it on a Google eyeglass or put it on my face will be something that's permanent. So I don't have to use my hands. I'd like the option to disconnect. Mm -hmm. And so disconnecting is such a powerful thing because again, it plays into everything we've been talking about. If you disconnect and you sit silently for four hours and I challenge anyone to do that, sit silently, don't watch a movie, sit in a chair, lie down, you and your thoughts and notice how noisy your head is. Notice what's going on in there. And it's so rare that we sit down and we do that. And we realize what we're really thinking. So I think a lot of this kind of boils down to we buy our own stories in our head and we see ourselves in a certain way. But if we really distill it and we really look at A, our actions every day, our time commitments, our attachments, the reason our subconscious, your reptilian brain will protect you. So if you believe, if you were a kid and someone did something to you, it's stored in your subconscious reptilian brain. And that essentially serves to protect you so now you're an adult and let's say when you're a kid someone made fun of you for something as an adult you're like I got over that that's fine but you go out and about and you realize that you don't go and approach people and speak to them for example and it's because your brain won't allow you to put yourself in uncomfortable situations and it's stored all these little things from when you were a child to basically say now we're protecting you we don't want you to go and speak to people so then you don't take risks. Then you don't risk failing and learning and growing. Like when we talk about the, the social media and 
being distracted? Do you have any rules for yourself where you can uh, that allow yourself to cut off completely? Like, do you bring your phone into the studio? Or there's like, do you shut off your phone? Uh, and also, do you even have mindfulness practices? Practices where it says it sounds like you maybe meditate a little bit as well. Mm. I wish I meditated more, which is probably the sentence most people who meditate will say, mm-hmm. or all people who meditate will say. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, I shut my phone off. I do shut my phone off quite frequently. I turn it off and I love it. It's one of my favorite, favorite times of the day. And I'm most creative when I turn the phone off. Even, even keeping the phone on and in a different room, you still know it's there. Mm-hmm. So turning it off and putting it in the back of a closet and just think it doesn't exist or leaving it at home. I love leaving it at home. It's one of my favorite things. Um, because then I go out and I can just be present. The past doesn't exist right now. The future doesn't exist right now. And not to go off on a complete tangent in that direction, but just to say, we're sitting at this table chit-chatting. Nothing else matters. What happened to me as a child doesn't matter. What's going to happen to me in the future doesn't matter. We're having a conversation. If I'm sitting there thinking about the future, thinking about the past, I'm unable to properly have a conversation with you. And if you take that to every other situation in life, dating, you're sitting in front of someone, you're on a date, you've chosen your outfit. And you're like, okay, you know, I want to I wanna look good. And you're like, I'm, do I sit like this? Do I sit like that? And you're like, am I leaning in too much? Am I not? They're talking. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe if I look like this, how's my hair? Did, did, you know, is my makeup? There's so much shit going on in your head. And they're telling you what they like. They're telling you what's going on in their day. They're having a conversation. They're getting to know with you. And we miss so many points of connection because we're too busy thinking, how am I coming off? Mm. You know, again, the subconscious beliefs, am I good enough? Am I worth it? Will this person like me? Will they love me? And we operate from need so much and from those subconscious triggers and behaviors that a lot of the time we miss just being in the moment. And I find that for myself, when I'm not in the moment, I can't create properly. I can't write honestly, because I'll sit down with an instrument and I'm thinking just about 10 other things that mean nothing that's not going to lend itself. I want to write about just all the noise that's going on. I want to have a simple focused emotion and I want to focus on it and feel it. And I think the main thing with social media is the multitasking aspect of it. If you really think, go through your phone, do Instagram, Facebook, all the different apps, our brains and our eyes get tired. It drains you of your energy. It's like sticking 10 different needles in your arm and letting it gradually drain you of all your blood. And then you wonder why you feel depleted at the end of the day, but you did nothing. So I started by realizing I would, I'd track my behavior years ago. This was like four or five years ago. I was like, I'm waking up and spending an hour just easily being online. But let's say I scrapped that hour and I do something else with it. And if I went through my day and I started eliminating all the social media, unless it was, I want to connect with my fans and post now. I'm going to post this mm. video or I'm going to post this thing and give myself some time to connect and then, you know, move on. I found that I suddenly had four hours in the day that were free and talk about hyper focus when it comes to time and what you're really going after at that point. I was like, Oh, okay. I have four extra hours in the day. What am I going to do with them? Well, remember all that shit you didn't have the time to do. Now you have the time to do it. And on top of that, you're more present when you do it. So again, this isn't really saying a lot of things that we don't know. I think we know them consciously, but I think really stopping and tracking our behavior is important. And I think acknowledging how much we rely on detaching and how much we're afraid to really just sit there and be with our thoughts, I think shows us a lot about ourselves in that moment. And I say this when I say ourselves, I mean each individual person. So we'll all have different habits. We'll Mm -hmm. all have different ways of going about it, but it is very freeing and I like it. So yeah, I I do take my phone into the studio. A lot of the time I have too much business to handle right now because I do a lot of different projects. Um, I write for, you know, commercials and movies and, and different artists. And again, in terms of different projects behind the scenes, I like being involved with charities. I like being involved with people. I like helping. Um, so yeah, finding time is something I can find a bit challenging and I've had to really work on time management it's not something i grew up with yeah i think that there is the the ideal which we strive for yeah. like the ideal to oh it, like i really want to wake up at 5 30 every day mm. and sometimes we we can make that happen 
but there are other times where life gets in the way and we had a really late night or we went out drinking with friends and then we have to sleep in and we mm. shouldn't push ourselves and uh, get too guilty for checking our phone or uh, checking email a couple times a day if our ideal would be to only schedule it for once or twice every day. I think there's no one right way of doing it. And I think what I've found is I've done the thing of waking up super early and being really strict on myself, but I know that my friends are going to call at 10 PM and want to hang out. Yeah. And I know that if I, if you really break it down and you go, what does my ideal day look like? And what do I want to do in life? Make it really simple. A lot of people say, believe in yourself and do then you sit there and you go, Okay, I'm going to believe in myself now, but deep down you don't believe in yourself. Do you know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. okay, different steps, right? Take steps to find inspiration to things that um, excite that part of yourself, that gradually show you ways to be done. That You know, you can find yourself a mentor. You can. This is talking across the board. It's not strictly musically. But um, my point is, I went through waking up early. I went through going to bed late. I went to trying all these different things. And essentially what I found is waking up slowly for me works i might wake up at 8 a.m but i allow myself an hour to do the things i want to do in the morning i love getting work done before noon because people wake up and then emails start coming in but it's also up to me to turn my phone off and go okay this is how i want to operate i know that i want the freedom to go out in the evenings i know that i want to occasionally stay up late i know i don't want to beat myself up for that so it's not so much about setting these rules and sticking to them it's about for me, it's about committing to who you want to be. And by that, I mean, how do you show up in the world? Are you a compassionate person? Are you true to your word? Do you, um, do you make music? Do you not make music? Do you make films? Do you, what, what is it that you do based on who you are as a person and who you're being? So are you being responsible? Are you late all the time? You're, control, you're in control of your actions 100% of the time. So who are you really being? Um, are you being the business manager? Are you being the social media person? Or are you being the artist? And if you really look at yourself and you ask yourself the question, who am I being? Go, okay, what do I want my day to look like? And who do I have to be to live that day to day? And often those behaviors break down to become how you behave on a day-to-day -day basis. So... Mm in terms of, okay, I want to be able to sleep a bit late, wake up a bit late. Does that fit my model of all the things that are important to me? All of the, all of the ways of being that I want to adopt in life that make me feel like I'm showing up the way I want to show up, that lead me towards what I feel is my purpose or what would make me matter. And at that point, you find that you're living in alignment with yourself. You're waking up, you're doing the things that matter to you, you're able to sleep better at night and you give yourself enough wiggle room because at the same time, we think doing, waking up, I must wake up at 5 a.m. and do this, this, this. Okay, but is that way of being really necessary for what you need to do? As a musician, do I need to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning? Well, it depends. If I create really well at 5 a.m. and it brings me loads of joy, then do that. Mm. Yeah, because I think a lot of people, they might see like the top 10 uh, business traits that all entrepreneurs have in common. Yeah. And then they just say, well, I better implement all 10 of these into my life if I want to be successful. And it sounds like what you're suggesting is first take a step back and ask what kind of life do you want to live? Like what are the things that are important to you? Mm -hmm. What kind of art do you want to create? And what is it going to take to get there? Uh, and then, yeah, like you And have what makes you matter? Yeah. Well, like underneath it all, what value do you feel you're bringing? And I think again, to echo every, every podcast out there, you know, and bringing value to a situation is, is extremely important. I mean, musicians, we, I'm creating music if you're making film, you start by creating something to put out there. You start by wanting to give value. You start by wanting to give something. So what makes you matter or what do you feel make? And that can be a hard question. People might sit there and be like, I don't know. Nothing makes me matter. Or we might have this idea that it has to be something incredibly huge. A lot of the time, the simplest ideas we don't value within ourselves. Like it has to be this yeah, there's the top 10 people who've got this stuff, but is it the top 10 people in the US? Is it the top 10 people worldwide? There are thousands of people. One thing I do know is across the board, they're responsible for their actions 100% of the time. Um, yes, do they delegate? Sure, if you're a CEO, you're delegating. 
you're also, if you distill all of these things, what you'll notice across the board is whether they wake up at 5 a.m., 10 a.m., whatever the hell they do, they are focused on the task at hand. They're hyper-focused with their time. They use their time wisely. And essentially across the board, the messaging behind what they're doing is consistent. We sometimes want things to come where we want them. Someone was quoting uh, The Pursuit of Happiness today. Mm. And the guy who's drowning in the water and a boat comes past and they're like, hi, can we help you? Can we save you? And he's like, no, I'm waiting for God. And then they're like, no, but seriously, let me save you. And he's like, no, 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 <laughs> like, I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for God. Yeah. And it's like, oh shit, okay. And then another boat comes past and the same interaction happens. And then he dies and he goes to heaven and he's like, what happened? You know, I was waiting for you. And God was like, I sent two boats. <laughs> and so we have this idea of what things are supposed to look like and how they're gonna come about. And a lot of the time that limits us in terms of what we're capable of doing. Transitioning from making rock music to releasing the stuff that I was making behind the scenes, there's a reason it took me a bit of time to release it. And that reason was I felt an obligation to the fans and I didn't want to, I had been a fan of bands who had completely changed their sound. And I was like, damn man, I really loved that and I needed that record. It's stuff that really kept me going and I wanted something. I wanted to be able to just rage. And then it completely changed. And so I didn't want to I didn't want to do that to our fans. I also wanted to keep the band so we can keep touring. And so what I did was I decided to put things out under my name as a solo artist. And that gave me more freedom to create the styles I was creating behind the scenes anyway. Mm. When I was 16, 17, I was making the rock record, but I was also producing a bunch of underground hip hop in the UK. So my new record is combining a lot of my production styles, but I did go through questions. I went through certain things. One, you know, lacking in inspiration at certain times. And I realized that I didn't want to make, I've never wanted to make the same record over and over again. So there was a journey for me to go, okay, well, I've, I had just, while I was touring with Tat, started working on a new sound and I loved it and I was super excited. But I also thought our fans might shit bricks if they hear it because they're gonna be like, what the hell is this? So I really took my time with it and I took the time to kind of perfect it and balance it, commit to the idea of going solo. And now that I'm doing it, I'm really happy and I'm really happy that people have embraced it. But that idea can also stop you from being creative it can stop you from allowing yourself to explore. So you think it has to happen in this way and this is what I have to do. But really, if you just stop, a lot of the time I'll be working on a song and I'll be so determined that this song has to be this way. I'll scrap it, take a piece of it, use it elsewhere, be completely open to something new and come up with a song that's 10 times better. Or we think I need to do this and the income's gonna come from here and blah, blah, blah. But then before you know it, someone's bringing you income in this direction and you're going, no, that's not the way I wanted it. I wanted it to be here. And you're like, you could be getting it for something completely different, but you don't always see it. So I think the attachment to how things should be is something that can really hold us back in life. And I think allowing ourselves to explore, allowing ourselves to be inspired, allowing allowing ourselves to, to commit to something even though we don't know the outcome is very important to exploring new paths and keeping things fresh, keeping things new, but also really bringing the best out of you ultimately. I know that that's a really cliche and simple thing to say, but. Mm. When you're working on something and you're putting so much time into creating an album, sometimes it takes years, uh, you you put it out and then when you finish the album, Is it difficult to let go of expectations, to let go of like, oh, I really want this to do well. I really want people to like it because in the music world specifically, it comes with a lot of criticism. I guess it comes with with most mediums. You put a documentary out or a movie out and (laughs) there's a lot of reviews and critics and people that want to shit on it or talk good about it. Uh, Is is that something that's challenging for you to do? Um. I think in a way that I don't always consciously recognize. So I noticed there was a review and I clicked to open it and I was like, why am I nervous to read this? And then, because yeah. I, I saw it there before I went to click on it, I was like, cool, it's there, it's not there. It kind of doesn't really matter to me in a lot of ways. Um, I think I think less so, less so than when I was younger. 
I think I'm not so attached to, and look, I could say this now, who knows, I could get a really shitty review and it could really knock me, but in a way, everything in life is medicine. You know, the good, the bad. How many, how many of us out there are saying, I'm really glad I went through that struggle because it made me stronger and it made me who I am excuse me, but then a struggle will come along tomorrow. And be like, oh, I don't want the struggle, blah, blah, blah. But my mom, to quote my mom, is like, life is another school. And it's true. And if you can appreciate the learning and know that in the end of the day, you're going to be okay. How many times did we think the world was going to come crashing down and yet it was okay? Our problems, for the most part, when we talk about our sort of creative struggles and everything, when I've, when I've struggled with anything, be it business, creative, if I've sat down and thought in a solution-based way, I've always found a solution. The solutions will come. It might not come that day, it might not come the next day, but it'll come eventually. I mean, look, we can, we all criticize. You know, we sit there and we criticize at home. I might hear a song and, and if I notice the first things out of my mouth, I'll be like, oh, they wasted that chorus, or oh, that's a shit lyric, or I can't listen to that song because it annoys me. But think if I was putting that in print, putting it on the internet and the artist had to read that. You know, there's, in a way, it's just an emotion, but I might be in a club and that song comes on. I also think there's different ways of listening to things. We think sometimes that like, this is a song and it must be appreciated in all mediums at the same time in the same way. I don't necessarily want to listen to drum and bass, um, you know, when I'm in the bathtub, but I could be in a nightclub and drum and bass comes on and I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. I found myself hating on songs on the radio and then I'm in a club and suddenly I'm moving going, what? I mean, <laughs> club is a big word, but this, I used yeah. to promote nightclubs a lot um, when I was growing up, um, uh, when I was in high school. And, and that was a big part of just being out and being exposed to so much music and dancing and feeling it and absorbing it. But essentially, um, we all, we're all critics in one way or another. And I think, you know, again, the cliche, our biggest critics are ourselves. Like you're probably not gonna criticize me as hardly as I'm gonna criticize myself, but you might come at angles I didn't expect. And you might say things that I wasn't paying attention to. Yeah. But at the same time, I like to kind of leave it where it is. I mean, you're like, you, I don't, I don't want to brush them off completely and I don't want to pay so much attention to them. For me, it's somewhere in the middle. Don't believe anyone who calls you a God and don't believe anyone that says you're a pile of shit. In the end of the day, make what you make. People are going to judge you. The person next to you might be thinking things that are way harsher than what the critic's actually printing, um, but they might not say it. So there's, again, attachment. Are you going to be attached to what the critic says and let it get in your way and play into your subconscious belief of I'm not good enough? Or are you going to follow the other path of things, which is you're going to judge me anyway, but this makes me happy. And most of the time, if you look at people who are successful, who have that story, that's the only thing that got them through. Mm. Like Kanye West is a very good example of someone who is, whatever you say about him, positive, negative, doesn't matter. The point is he is plowing ahead. He is just moving forward. He's believing in himself. He's detaching in a lot of ways. And I don't know him personally. I don't know whether he's, how attached he is or detached, but he's giving the impression of expressing himself so wholly and freely. And I'm sure there's subconscious levels there that are leading him to do that. But at the same time, negative things can be said. That's not stopping him from creating. It's not holding him back. He might respond in music. He might respond in certain ways. But there are a lot of us that might be like, oh, that's a bad review and I'm going to feel really bad about it and stop making. I've seen creatives stop. Mm. But I think the biggest sin is to stop based on someone. You're not living for someone else. If you live for someone else, you're diluting who you are. People will vibe on who you are. And that's proof every single day is obvious because people are doing the weirdest shit on planet Earth and people are loving it. They're yeah. lapping it up. So go do you. Yeah. Be weird. Do some weird shit. Who cares? We're all going to be rubble and dust in the end of the day. And I always think to myself, if I'm lying in my grave right now, having a conversation with myself, I'm like, it's over, it's done, I'm dead. Cool. Is what I'm going through today an issue? Should I let it stop me? And generally, this dead lady who's, I'd like to think 110, but she's not, who's like really in shape, you know what I mean? Like she was fucking till she was 90. <laughs> but no, nah, I'm pretty much like 84 to 94 and I'm lying there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I'm yeah, going, realistically. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, life's over and I'm like, wow, if I'm that age looking back, I really don't give a shit. And there was a saying I tried to live by in my 20s, which was, if only youth knew and if only age could. And so my thing was, okay, let's just fight. You know, you have like, my parents were in their 50s and they just didn't give a 
fuck about anything and it was brilliant and they're just like yeah whatever who cares and you get to that age where you don't care there's always a curmudgeon granddad who's like in the corner being like hey suck a dick and you're like <laughs> yeah what they it's don't def- care it's definitely like the old guys in the locker room that just are naked and they don't give a shit but then oh, the young yeah, guys yeah. are all like nervous and scared exactly wouldn't it be awesome to just be young and not scared and in a way as teenagers with that we're like wow this is the world it's all gonna be really cool and then you leave school and everyone takes a shit on you and you're like wow this is not what i thought it would be and I'm really lucky to have not had to go through the system. You know, I've, I've always had different jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the end of the day, you know, life, you go through a breakup and you take those scars and then you go through another breakup and you take those scars. And then you, there's so many things that you do. I feel very, very lucky and blessed in a musical sense um, because I've been very lucky in how my music's been received and it's been nice. But also I haven't released a lot of other stuff because I didn't feel right in it anyway. I could have released stuff and people would have hated it. And that's gonna happen. That is absolutely gonna happen. And I hope at that point I look at it and I go, okay, I'm gonna try and take things that I can relate to in what they're saying. It's all about how you relate. Can I relate to what they're saying? Can I agree with what they're saying? And is that something I want to improve on? Or is this just the path I wanna go down? The next track that comes out, On the road, we've just been playing it for two months. It was the first tour I did as a solo artist. It was amazing and I'm stoked. So thank you to everybody who came out. And there's one song in particular that people kept posting. I was really surprised. I didn't expect that to be the song. Mm. And that song's coming out on September the 28th. It's called Make Me Feel. Um, And the sound- Why didn't you think that 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 one was, uh, was a good one? Well, you know, actually what's really funny is I set out to write a shit song. Um, I hadn't written a song that year. I had just been doing other projects and this is, this is a little while ago. And right when I was going into recording this solo project, I was like, you know what? I want to write a new song, but I'm tired of putting myself under all this pressure because I had, I'd just been, just different things were going on at that time. And I was giving myself a lot of pressure at that moment. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna write a shit song. This is going to be a deliberate shit song to clean the pipes, get it out. And <laughs> And I started writing it and I was like, okay, here we go. Crap song. Awesome. This sucks. And I was just saying whatever the hell I felt, whatever the hell I thought. And, and then it kind of stuck. And then the next thing I was walking to the grocery store and I was singing it and I was like, no man, this is a shit song. Don't start liking it now. (laughs) And so I kind of did it just to get it out, just to clean the pipes, just to, okay, we've now written something. Who cares? No pressure. And it's amazing what happens when you give yourself no pressure. It's almost that if you, if you give someone else the credit for all of your successes and all of your failures, it's amazing what you'll do. If I'm like, yo, for anything I do or don't do, you get the credit. I will start creating like nobody's business. I'll explore, mm. I'll do the weirdest shit. Why? Because all my childhood shit or all my am I not good enough, all the reasons, we're all out there just trying to be loved or wanting to be loved in the end of the day. And when you accept, that's why the whole loving yourself is so important. We don't always put those two things together. But loving yourself is important because it's the only place where you can guarantee where you operate from. And if you don't operate from a place of I need this and I need this and I need this, you're just doing things because you want to and because they feel right. And you're operating from a much clearer perspective. So essentially, yeah, and it's a similar thing of going, I'm deliberately going to write a crap song. And then I did it and someone liked it and they were like you know what let's work on this song and so we did some additional production on the song with some friends of mine and they brought it to life in a great way and I was like oh that's really cool so I played it to a couple of people on my team one person was like this is my favorite song I love it two other people were like yeah it's a bit of a b-side so I was like okay well Mm -hmm. jury's out who cares we can keep going so we keep going and it's interesting some people will look at it and go yeah okay it's all right But then somehow I'm finding more and more and more people saying, I love this song. I love this song. It's great. It's my PR company's favorite song. It's, you know, just a different our collections agency's favorite song. And I'm sitting there going, hang on a sec. Um, That was really random and I didn't expect it. But again, if I sat down and went, I'm going to write the best song of all time. And I put all that pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the hell I would have written. But the irony that coming out with a song that was, you know, just supposed to be crap and people are now picking up on it and putting it out there is a perfect testament to the idea that again you can write something in five minutes it can be the best thing you've ever done and a lot of musicians will say not that that took five minutes but it was sort of segueing into the idea of people saying I sat down and I wrote my best song in five minutes and this other song took me three years now our biggest song as a band took me three years to write 
it was a seven minute song and I kept cutting it down. It's called Road to Paradise. And I started with this riff and I refused to let the riff go. And I kept building on it, building on it, building on it. So there's something to be said for the craft. Right. And not getting too strict with rules. Not We're getting like, too well, strict. since like if it, if it only takes five minutes to write like a really hit song, maybe I'll just spend five minutes on every song. And it's like, that's life doesn't work like that. Exactly. And it's the same. It's the same with everything. I think if you can really distill it down to for me, it's am I being responsible for my actions? Am I showing up on time? Am I um, being committed to what's really important to me? Um, am I being compassionate in the ways that are true to me as well? There are certain things where if you really distill it down to ways of being, it's no longer about your rule book of did I do this at 2 p.m. and that at 2 p.m. because that just messes with your head. And doing things is like thinking things. It's not completely connected to your core and what you feel so I try to not operate from that place when I'm writing and I think again saying I'm not we can get really into when you're writing a song you think I must write a song and I could sit here and have a conversation with you and tell you all sorts of shit and then I get into the music and it's suddenly like this is really poetic and you know and you just you get into songwriting mode which is a lot of the times a less honest place because you're thinking about the rhyming and you're, you're thinking is the problem so a lot of the time I like to just freestyle over shit and just express myself, say what's on my mind. And then the editing process can take a long time, but essentially the first seed of something that may come in five minutes. I have a song called Stay Up. I wrote that song in 10 minutes, the whole song, lyrics, music, everything. And I would love to sit down and write another song like that in 10 minutes. And it's gonna happen at some point in my life when I'm really connected and I need to just dump something but I want to keep creating. So I've got to, so long as again, I'm following the ways of being that are important to me. It doesn't matter when I do something or how I do something. If I decide to write my day on paper and say, which I do often just because again, there's so much going on. From this time to this time, I'm going to do this. From this time to this time, I'm going to do this. It eliminates a lot of time wasting. When your days are scheduled in advance, you don't emotionally question what you're up to. You go, I said I would do this. I'm going to do this. You can change what that looks like every single day. So long as when you do it, you commit to it. So long as you're responsible for what you've put on paper. So long as you follow through. Um, or at least those are important things to me. Yeah, because you're, you're kind of scheduling the spontaneity. So you can schedule that four-hour block when you sit down and write. But it yeah. doesn't mean that the writing itself is very structured and rigid. Because a lot of times with it needs to be free-flowing. You need to be able to, like you said, freestyle and try to figure out things in the moment. Yeah, and sometimes what I'll do is... I know that I have a lot of business and different projects going on and I go, and here's your one hour to sit down and do some lyrics. And when I'm in it, I've got so much adrenaline because I've been on 50,000 different phone calls that I'm like, no, nah, I've worked I've worked out that that doesn't always work for me. That what's actually, what's actually a little bit more beneficial is if I have three days of maybe business and then I just block out three days for creativity and no one can reach me and my phone is off and maybe it's one day, maybe it's two days. Um, but I go do that and it allows me to just fully get in the zone and not have to stop when I'm feeling creative. So those are ways that work for me and everybody has their thing. You know, sometimes knowing that I only have two hours to create actually enables me to do a lot because I'm not sitting there thinking I have all day and getting distracted and faffing around. So I do things differently every day. Um, and I found things that work better. But again, if I go out at nighttime, the next day I might wake up a little bit later. I have to create a bit of room for that. Um, if I, you know, I might have my days and go, this is what I do at this time. Cool. But someone might be like, let's be in the studio all day on Thursday. Where does that leave your Thursday? Where mm -hmm. does that leave your routine? So again, if I'm at the basis following my ways of being that are important and dictate how I show up every day, I end up finding room for all of those things. So long as I approach them with that way of being. So it's less about what you do and how you be essentially if you could give advice to somebody who's just getting started out like the young creators those that are facing a lot of doubts mm. uh, about putting their stuff out there uh, whether they're a musician or a filmmaker or an artist what would you tell them just do it that's nike. your simplest answer i love it <laughs> yeah sponsored by nike yeah i mean we can sit there and talk all day about like well i want to do it but i don't feel like you know i'm good enough Okay, well then get better. Do you know what I mean? I don't, I, I don't feel good. Okay, well, a lot of people start out things not good enough. You know, I'm not a good enough piano player or guitar player, so practice. I'm not a worthwhile human being. Okay, but um, 
let's look back into that and let's see. I mean, you know, if you've, did you do something at school where you felt worthwhile if you're a kid? Um, did someone like you? Do your parents like you? Did you, you can always find something that you've done at some point that is worthy that you haven't acknowledged as worthy because again, you're waiting for, you're waiting for it to come the way you want it to come. You know, it's like yeah. you're waiting for God to save you. Yeah, God sent you two boats if you believe in God. But essentially, um, I would say just do it. And if you're stuck on something, take a break, sure, but come back to it and work on it. And don't, again, you're going to be judged anyway. And if you don't do it now, in 10 years time, you're going to look back and still be like, I want to do it. And a lot of the time, you know, we talk about midlife crises. I feel like a lot of the midlife crises come in people following this rigid way of living. And we, I mean, there's, there's also coming to terms with a different shift in mortality and life. And I haven't been there. So I'm, I don't want to speak broadly on the subject um, and be too, too generalizing. But I will say that two patterns that seem to play into it are number one, immortality and coming to realization, which again, I think we're all going to get to. Um, but also the idea that you went to school, you did what you needed to do. You got yourself a job. You did what you needed to do. You're a good husband or wife. You did what you needed to do. You got anxious because you were whatever, reaching 30 and didn't do what you needed to do, but then you managed to pull it together and that's fine. And then you hit 40 and then you sort of get to a point where like, I did everything I was supposed to do, but I did nothing I wanted to do. And now I'm realizing that I want to live because life doesn't last forever in, in this particular, you know, realm plane. Um, and this particular part of the journey is going to come to an end. And yet what the hell did I do? So at that point it's like, well, shit, now I have the money or maybe I don't have the money, but I have the desire and I'm more settled. Now I want to play. Now I want to do stuff. And I just feel like the more work you can do on yourself sooner and the more you can confront your subconscious, the more you can confront your weaknesses, if you want to call them that. But I wouldn't call them weaknesses. I'd just say the things that might hold you back from doing what you want to do or being operating from your truest self. The more you can do that and the earlier you can do that, the more chance you stand um, in life to kind of just live from a truer place and regret less. And you can, you can talk all day about a particular lyric or not a particular lyric or, you know, well, I don't, there's always reasons to stop you. Just do it. Again, look at mumble rap that's out there at the moment. Look at dudes with face, tat face tats and rainbow colored hair. Some of the lyrics they're out there. And I'm talking, that's one medium. There is room for everything and everyone. Just do you. Do what you want to do. You never know. And in five years time, you might look back and realize someone else did it and kick yourself because you're like, you know what? It would have been safe for me to do that. It's all safe. You can listen to a hundred podcasts that say do it. You can listen to a hundred people say believe in yourself. You can listen to a million and one different things. Get off the podcast and mm -hmm. then still be like, I still don't know how to do it. So I would say, just think about three things. Look at your time. Is it really focused on what you're trying to do? Or is it like you do a bit of it every day? Are you truly, truly putting your time and energy where you want it to go? Number two, attachments. Are you attached to who you should be? Or is it really what you want to do? Are you attached to I'm not good enough? And is that getting in the way? And look at that. Look at your stories, good and bad. And number three, commitment. You will get motivated if you start with commitment. So start by being committed to your time, letting go of attachments. Be committed to it. Wake up in the morning and for two weeks, you might not know how to do something. Just say to yourself, I'm going to do it for an hour a day for two weeks or two hours a day. At the end of those two weeks, you're going to look back and go, oh my God, I've done so much in two weeks. How cool. I didn't know this was possible. Great. I'm going to keep doing it. And you get motivation and be committed to inspiration. Be committed to growing and increasing your skill set and just see where that gets you. Don't be so married to an outcome. Be married to how you can grow within yourself and let the outcomes happen. So I forget what the question was. <laughs> Dude, Tatiana, thank you so much for doing this podcast. Thanks I am me. your newest fan. I absolutely love your music. It's Thanks, man. so good. Thank you. Uh, if people want to hear from you, hear your music, where should we send them? Um, Spotify. Uh, Apple Music, iTunes, YouTube. I mean, it's everywhere, but I'd say go check it out on Spotify. The name's Tatiana De Maria. 
Um, there's a few songs out now. As I said, there's another one coming out on September the 28th called Make Me Feel. I'm excited. Check it out. See what you think for yourself. And then, um, yeah, there's a new album coming out in the new year and a lot of new music. Actually, also, I'm playing a show in LA. I'm headlining the Whiskey A Go Go on October the 13th. Tatiana, thank you so much for doing the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for listening to The Ground Up Show. If you like this episode, you can help support this show and make sure that we can keep it advertisement free. Head over to patreon.com slash Matt Diavella for just $1 per episode. That's $4 a month. Not that much money. You can help keep this show going. Thank you guys for listening, and I'll see you next week.